Adi, do you remember the day that you asked uh, Joshua to confront the perpetrators? And do you have any regrets? Apakah Adi ingat hari pertama Adi bilang sama Joshua bahwa Adi ingin bertemu dengan uh, pelakunya? Dan apakah selama ini ada penyesalan? Waktu tahun 2003 atau 2004 itu saya sudah mengutarakan sama Jos. Dan saya merasa waktu itu juga tidak mungkin untuk bertemu. Si Jos melarang demi keamanan, katanya kan. Tapi pada akhirnya saya dipertemukan dan saya sangat senang karena telah berhasil bisa bertemu langsung dengan para pembunuh. Um, yeah, I, when, when, when I first suggested to Joshua that I, I wanted, when I first told Joshua I wanted to meet the perpetrators, he said no, it's too dangerous. And I was frustrated, <laughs> but then when we found a way of doing it safely, I, I'm very, very glad we were able to do it. What made you trust Joshua? How did you know that he would protect you and you would be safe? Apa yang membuat Adi percaya sama Joshua dan bahwa Joshua akan melindungi Adi setelah uh, selama proses pembuatan film ini? Saya pikir Joshua Joshua juga terlalu berani menanggung resiko ya. Hanya satu-satu Joshua yang berani pada waktu itu untuk mengungkap di Indonesia adalah sesuatu hal yang sangat tabu. Makanya saya sangat percaya sekali dan itu adalah sesuatu hal yang pernah saya uh, terpikir di hati saya ketika saya masih anak-anak. I could feel something about Joshua that would that would be protective and keep us safe, but I do have to admit that, that Joshua is also I have to talk about myself. <laughs> Joshua is also very um, very brave, uh, and and in fact the only person in Indonesia who'd come to Indonesia who had the courage to open this up in such an effective way over such a long time, and. I sort of felt that someone who has that courage and the systematic way of going about things would have the, would, would also was clearly thinking about all the risks and would, would be able to keep us safe. Going back to the filming, was there a question that you wish you'd asked the perpetrators that you did not ask or was there something you would have changed about the entire filming process? Kembali ketika ke proses pembuatan film, apakah ada pertanyaan yang ditujukan buat pembunuh yang nggak sempat atau tidak bisa Mas Adi sampaikan pada saat itu? Atau apakah ada harapan lain uh, terhadap bagaimana proses pembuatan film ini uh, yang, 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 yang ada? Dan ini harus singkat. Pada waktu itu sangat banyak sebetulnya yang saya ingin bertanyakan kepada para pelaku. Akan tetapi itu adalah sesuatu hal yang tidak mungkin karena untuk membongkar atau menge uh, mengorek keterangan dari para pelaku yang pada akhirnya mengetahui bahwa yang bertanya itu adalah keluarga daripada yang mereka bunuh itu adalah sesuatu yang sangat tidak mustahil makanya tidak tidak banyak uh, pertanyaan yang bisa saya lakukan pada waktu itu there were so many questions i wanted to ask at the time that i couldn't ask because it just felt it felt dangerous it felt impossible given the situation either of the perpetrator or their families and it and and so it's odd to think what would I have liked to ask because I still remember the experience and remember all the questions that I wish I could have asked but felt like impossible to ask or too dangerous to ask at, at the time. Right. Joshua, I believe you've said that it's the function of art to make us look at our most painful truths. What truth is faced about the look of silence? I think perhaps that First of all, every perpetrator in our in our history is a human being, and that uh, that's something already clear from my first film, actually. But that here, that until we that the that again and again in the look of silence, we hear "Let the past be past," and survivors always say it out of fear. Perpetrators always say it as a threat, which means the past isn't past. It's right there. It's an open wound. It's keeping people afraid. It's empowering perpetrators to threaten. And I suppose if the film has any perhaps its most important message is that every society everywhere in the world will be torn asunder by impunity and form subtle insidious forms of fear until we collectively find the courage to stay still, turn around, look to the past and acknowledge together what we've done to each other and, and have the painful discussion how are we going to then turn back to the future but finding a way of living together where we can make sure these things never happen again.
So in keeping with that, if the act of killing is a film about denial and about lying to oneself to justify one's actions, what is The Look of Silence? I think The Look of Silence is kind of a poem, a kind of backward-looking poem, highly dramatic because there's never been a film where survivors are confronting perpetrators while the perpetrators are still in power before this. But it's a poem about what does it do, what does fear do to human beings? What does it do to have to live for 50 years in fear and silence? Mm -hmm. Now, I think you'd said that you wanted to keep your film from looking less journalistic and and topical because you felt that um, it would have a longer life. How did you how did you keep the film away from that style, that sort of newsroom style? Well, I don't think I was trying to uh, avoid a journalistic style in order to give the film a longer life. I think I was simply I simply recognized that uh, I, I wanted the film to immerse you in Adi's family. I wanted you to feel like you are Adi or your brother's Adi and uh, his parents are your parents or your grandparents and his children are your children. So th and that sort of counterintuitively, therefore, by going small, by being very microscopic, the film would become much bigger and about all of us. It would become universal. And the way I did that was by finding a very by, by thinking of the film as a succession of experiences for the audience, a succession of tones, of moods, where you feel the haunted, uh, tr haunted space in which this family is forced to live, the fear, the silence, the ghosts, you feel it in your body. And yes, you might call that storytelling, but unlike a news story, which presents a world out there, here it's, like, it's almost, I've tried to create a kind of physical, immersive experience so you know what it's like to live in fear. And the power of the film comes not from thinking, oh no, look at what these people are suffering out there, but rather, oh yes, of course this is what fear would do to us. And of course, actually, we all live in fear in some ways. And of course, this is about all of us. Right. So you said that uh, cinema is a powerful tool for intervention. So with the look of silence and the act of killing, what resolution has come? I wouldn't say any resolutions come, but the act of killing helped uh, prompt a fundamental change in how Indonesia, Indonesia talks about its past. It's raised awareness around the world of the genocide, but also led to discussions all over the world about impunity, especially in post-conflict uh, situations. The look of silence has entered that space everywhere the act of killing went and deepened and expanded that conversation to be one about what happens, uh, about how, how urgently truth and reconciliation are needed in the aftermath of uh, mass killings and how, and, and any form of atrocity, and how, uh, and, and, and in Indonesia specifically, the, the look of silence has screened thousands of times, uh, five, upwards of 5,000 times. It's distributed by the government, by the National Human Rights Commission, at the same time as it's banned by another part of the government, the Film Censorship Board, under, with, due to pressure from the military. And so we have this uh, extraordinary situation where a country's grappling really urgently and, and intensely with the question of its own past. And that's an on, there's no resolution to that yet, but the, the, the movement for truth, justice, and reconciliation has been, I think, profoundly activated and energized by the film. Thank you. Thank you both. Very Thank nice. you.